So I've called this here Climate Holy Trinity, Codency International and Courage, Yet Deliver on Our 23C Commitment. Um, and I have a Twitter account which I just use for work for those people that engage in uh, Twitter. Um, I'm going to start off with a thought experiment, and then anyone's ever heard me speak before, some of, you might know the answer to this, and you, you'll have seen some of these slides um, before various times. But the thought experiment is that um, imagine that uh, we thought climate change was a serious issue. There's no evidence that global emitters to reduce their carbon footprint to the level of the average European so just the average EU citizen actually so just the, just the top 10% and the other 90% make no reductions no increases but no, no reductions they just carry on as they're today do you have any sort of sense as to what well would there be any major reduction in global emissions do they, if so what sort of size do you think you might see any ideas well it's about a one-third cut in global emissions so if 90% of the global population did nothing, just carried on as they are today, and just that 10% reduced to the level of the average European, not the average Ghanaian, the average European, that's a 30% cut. And just bear in mind that the Paris pledges have no reduction by 2030. So that shows how keen we are on climate change. My provocation is that the shrinking budgets we have um, for 2 degrees centigrade, or indeed 1.5, together with highly um, in unequal responsibility for carbon dioxide, and I'll be drawing that out during this presentation, embed equity at the heart of real mitigation. I couldn't have said that in 1990, slightly started to say it in 2000, perhaps by 2005, 2010, definitely equity becomes important. By 2019, it's absolutely at the heart of responding to climate change. I'll try and show why that is the case now. And the taboo issue of the asymmetric distribution of wealth, again, that's only because we've left it so late, underpins our ongoing failure to tackle climate change. This is my provocation. And that only when we acknowledge that will we move away from the incremental nonsense that we've done for the last 30 years to something that's much more akin with the system change that is now demanded for 2 degrees centigrade of warming. So that's my provocation. Um, we're still dominating the course at the moment, this is in the news, there's only two things in the news are Brexit and Davos. Um, you know, this, is, this is the sort of view that I still hold of Davos, very much along these sort of lines. Um, and we're doing just fine with the Davos thing, we mustn't disturb the dominant socio-economic paradigm, ongoing growth, resources and power um, skewed to a privileged few who look after the rest of us, look down on us and make sure the world works well for us. It's just interesting to note that um, in the climate discussions there, some of you will have seen this in the papers, covered by a lot of the papers, there were between 1,000 and 1,500 private jets flying the morally bereft to, um, to Davos to discuss issues around climate change. Um, and it's about time we called these people out. But on climate, I would argue the Davos paradigm is legitimised in relation to climate change by a whole load of what I, um, uh, I, yeah, I think it's fair to say, pejoratively referred to as the climate glitterati whether that's Bloomberg, DiCaprio, Nick Stern, Christiana Figueres, Al Gore, or, or, or Mark Carney. All these people have you know, absolutely huge carbon footprints and then tell the rest of the world about what we need to do about climate change as they fly around in first class or business jet or their private business planes. But they're supported by a whole cadre of senior academics. So the academic community is, is desperately trying to ingratiate themselves to this group. You know, they'll, they'll embed offsetting, negative emissions, geoengineering, carbon capture and storage, green growth, anything there that maintains um, evolution in relation to climate change within the system. The last thing we can do is propose something that may actually question the system. We mustn't do that. Now, it's not to say we, those things in isolation might have some role to play, but the, collectively they're our dominant paradigm. So we've got Davos, but basically you can change it for COP. You can shove in the glitterati up here. And we're not worried about hunger and poverty. We'll be out there going to sessions on negative emissions, electric planes, and astrology. So it's actually, even if you look at the cops, they're taken over by this sort of mindset. And I actually wrote them about the cop when I was there this year. And you go along to the side events and you'll just hear repeatedly wonderful stories about how every country has been doing, often supported by senior academics and NGOs. And then you think, well, hang on, the emissions went up by 2.7%. How can that be the case if every country is doing really well? Someone somewhere is lying. So let's put, this is a provocation. So let's put some, some bones on that provocation. 
So the international agenda, I mean, this is stuff you're all going to know, I suppose, so I can go through it quite quickly. Climate change, uh, Paris commitment, hold well below two, um, ideally aim for 1.5. And the reason we went, the argument was for 1.5, that many people are fully aware at two degrees C, lots of people will die. Probably quite a few people will die at 1.5. And let's also be clear that we know who they are and we've known for a long time. They'll be low emitters, they'll be a long way from here, they'll um, typically be non-white. So we know who they are. And we've known that for the last 20 years, and we haven't cared. Let's be blunt about that. Let's just, just paint the picture as it is. We haven't cared. But fortunately, in Paris, that community did start to put a bit of pressure on the world and came up with this idea of should we aim for 1.5? And it's certainly, um, with a 1.5 report, it does suggest that there are merits to that. Also, that we would take action in accordance with the best science, and most importantly, or very, not most, but very importantly, on the basis of equity. That was embedded in the agreement, embedded in every agreement we've had back to Kyoto Protocol. And yet, when you look at it, no country takes any notice of equity, including the UK, including the Committee on Climate Change, the new Swedish climate change law. Equity is just dismissed out of hand. A bit of lip service, but that's about it, and I'll come back to that later. I'm not going to go into the 1.5 report, but just a couple of quick reflections from it. Um, initially, I was really quite negative about us having a 1.5 degree support because I don't think it's achievable. Um, nevertheless, I think I've changed my mind a little bit since it came out. I'm going to just draw two headlines, headline conclusions from it. There's obviously a lot of wonderful work in there. And the first one I think is really important is to recognise that it does appear that the, from an impacts point of view, the impacts are much worse at two degrees centigrade than one and a half. So half a degree may not sound much to most of us, but uh, particularly if you live in Manchester, I mean, we, we'd like some more warmth, really. Um, but actually, when you look at it in terms of ecosystem impacts, in terms of additional risks of feedbacks, and also lots of more people um, impacted by climate change seriously, between 2 and 1.5. So 1.5, you can definitely see good reasons for going there. Um, but then when you look at the mitigation story, it's the usual sort of thing, loads and loads of negative emissions, anything to delay action. Um, so the way I see it is much more, we have to aim for two degrees centigrade with what I call real mitigation, which is actually reducing our emissions. Um, and maybe that's to be complemented with some sort of planetary scale negative emissions, which if they work at scale, great. And I'm all for, let's fund a really good program of looking into these things, but let's not assume they work. Let's assume they don't work. Um, but let's fund some good research into them. Um, but I think also what's really important, and those who looked at the report will have seen this, it then talks about the impact of the 1.5 sort of framework and mitigation agenda um, on the different SDGs. And looking at this one here, um, the old famous, uh, this is growth goes on forever. No physics in that, but anyway. Um, the, you know, the IPCC claim that few trade-offs and strong synergies between 1.5 mitigation and economic growth. Does anyone actually believe that? You then look at the sort of, the, this is the bar chart from there. These are the impacts of the different sort of issues they're looking at. So every time they're the impact, the negative impacts, these are the positive. These are the negative, these are the positive. These are the negative, these are the positive. So, you know, 1 1.5, the, you know, what we'd have to do for 1.5 somehow fits with a growing economy. I think really, no one's really thought that through. That's just there to assuage the uh, um, economic sensibilities of our political system. I did write a response to this, and what I find quite worrying is that the IPCC quite meticulously went out for the impacts, and I, I say I like that, but then I think sadly um, it failed again to address the profound implications of reducing emissions in line with both 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade. Dress it up however we may wish, climate change is ultimately a rationing issue. We've got to ration out our very limited amount of carbon emissions, and we don't like the idea of rationing, but that's what it is. There's no neat way out of that. <laughs> Ignoring the huge inequality in emissions again, the IPCC chooses to construct its, construct its policy advice to neatly fit with the current economic model. It's one of the reasons I don't think Working Group 3 should be in the IPCC, even though I think the new chairs of Working Group 3 are very good. I think it's, mitigation is too much innately a political issue to have a decent consensus on. Um, so let's go back to two degrees centigrade of framing. Um, and I'm going to start off with a bit of sort of, you know, I think it's a good point, just where are we today? A bit of humility about our starting position. The first IPCC report came out before most of uh, your parents met. Think about that. Quite a lot of you here. Your parents hadn't met and we had the first report from the IPCC which told us basically everything we needed to know to respond to climate change. So during all of your life, your parents and people of my generation have chosen to fail you. It's not as if we weren't, didn't have the information. We had the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. Probably a few of you then weren't even born. Yeah, in 2018, emissions were 65%, almost 65% so higher than in 1990. 2018, they look like they've risen by about 2 to 3%, 2.7% is the best guess at the moment from the Global Carbon Project. So despite all this, we've actually seen emissions still going up. Just, just think about it. Emissions are still rising. 
28 to 29 years after the first IPCC report. Despite all the optimistic rhetoric and smiling, grinning policymakers, entrepreneurs and academics, we've had 28 years of abject failure on climate change. And I think it's worth just reminding how appallingly we've failed. It's not that we haven't brought the emissions down, we've just watched them go up. And in fact, since 2000, the rate at which they've gone up is even faster than during the 1990s. And why have we seen this? Well, there's a whole suite of reasons, but I think it is important to sort of capture a few of the things that have helped us um, avoid any action. Offsetting, let's pay the poor people to diet for us. If you want to lose weight, you can't ask someone else to cut back on the chocolate. And it's the same with um, you know, climate change. You can't ask someone else to do it for you. Yet we then sanction that at a government level with a clean development mechanism. As soon as you start to give these things an official sounding name, they sound like they actually mean something in the real world, which of course they don't, other than procrastination. Um, so that was state sanctioned offsetting. Then we had the emissions trading scheme, where let's have so many permits issued that the price of carbon remains virtually zero. Now that's changing, but it's been a long time since the EUTS was actually there. So in the interim, it's been used as an excuse again for inaction. You can just look at the uh, literature in the, U in the UK about that. Then we have this idea now of afforestation, plant a tree, grow an airport. That's the argument that's being made for the uh, main airport in Stockholm in Sweden. We can expand the Arlanda Airport because we're going to plant more trees in Sweden. And if all that fails as it's going to, and it is, then we're relying on speculative negative emissions at huge planetary scale. Astronomical levels of negative emissions are assumed in most of the models. I'm not saying that they won't work, but we also don't know if they will. And they, there's certainly a lot of concern about whether they work at any planetary scale. And when that lot doesn't work, we're going to have a sticking plaster called geoengineering. So we're not going to try and solve the problem. We're going to put something over the top of it and mask it. Again, maybe that's, there are some merits for that, perhaps for some sort of select ecosystems, if we can control it in some way. But the idea that this is what we're doing, and yet we've had, we have not tried yet to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. So we've had climate change since 19... Well, not only since 1990. We've had a good understanding since 1990, if not before. And we haven't tried to reduce our emissions. We've tried all this lot, though. And it's easy to turn around, as you'll find lots of co-opted academics in the UK will do, and, and the NGOs, and say, well, look, the UK is doing really well. We've got, you know, we've got green growth here. We're out decoupling. Sweden says that, Denmark says that, and France says it. So the four sort of European climate progressive countries. And yet, <laughs> when you actually look at it, there's no change in our emissions since, virtually no change in our emissions in 1990. The UK is a slight exception. It's come down at 0.4% per annum. Yeehaw. 0.4% from 1990. Once you factor in aviation and shipping, which most analysis conveniently ignore, I don't know who takes responsibility for those emissions, it must be God, but someone, no country takes responsibility for them, they're, they're every country trying to grow them, um, and imports and exports. So you take those into account, operating UK PLC and these other countries have seen no reduction since 1990. Um, Norway's up 25, uh, 50%, Ireland's up 25%, I think, and I, I could get this wrong, I think it's either Belgium or the Netherlands, so I should really check. One of those is up by about 25%. So you just don't see much success, even in what are often seen to be climate progressive countries. So let's not pretend that we've succeeded. So once you've laid out really where we are now, as I would see it, and you may disagree with some of the numbers, but most of them just come from government stats, where do we go from here? Now, well, we've got the AR5 reports from the IPCC, and I'm going to summarise them in one sentence, which is obviously clearly very unfair. Um, it's carbon budgets that matter, and um, I know that there'll be some people here, as I'm looking over there, that would slightly disagree with that view, but I think it's probably quite nuanced, but we'll, we can discuss that maybe later. Um, it's not long-term targets. What we do by 2050 doesn't really matter if we just leave it out till 2040 before doing anything. It's, so it's, to think of it this way, it's, you know, the temperature relates to the total amount of CO2 we dump in the atmosphere. Um, and the concentration in, in the CO2 in the atmosphere. So if we, try, if we decide to expand uh, Heathrow Airport, or just as we have done now, just celebrate the launch of a new oil platform, the Clare Ridge platform, 50,000 billion ton, 50, tonnes of CO2 a day from that oil platform, that the life expectancy from BP is it'll put out another quarter of a billion tonnes. That platform only went out in November and celebrated, uh, sorry, December, celebrated by Claire Perry, the Minister for Energy and Clean Growth during the Katowice COP. Um, the other day I was at another event um, at a court case trying to stop some more shale gas development um, in the northwest. Shale gas development, 75% is methane, 75% by weight of it is, is carbon, so when you burn it you get lots of CO2. So we've got Heathrow, shale gas, new oil platforms. So that's what this is. And then next generation have to do this, have to suck it out of the atmosphere in some way or, or find some very fast ways of mitigation. So it's the air under the curve that matters. So every day we choose to fail now, we are passing again generationally, generationally the burden onto, the, onto some of you here. And I'm hoping to be here for a long time as well with some stem cell research. So um, 
<laughs> so it would be affecting my future as well. Um, so how big is the budget? And this is where we can have a lot of arguments as to how big the budget is, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit, little bit later, but I think it, it, it can be a bit of a, a technical distraction in some extent. So going from AR5, and we could argue we should use the stuff from, um, uh, from the 1.5 report, but there are some reasons why I'm not doing that here. Um, we've probably got about 700 billion tonnes of CO2 left. Now, it could be a bit higher than that, it could be a bit lower than that, and I'll touch on that in a minute. But something like that, if you take the... That's the same sort of range that the IEA used, same starting values from the International Energy Agency, or the recent Rockstrom paper, so it's not an uncommon sort of starting point. And we dump about 43 billion tonnes of CO2 in the atmosphere each year at the moment. That's about 16 years of current emissions. Something like that. Um, so if you want to quantify this in relation to the Paris Agreement and what we need to do, and this is actually this is the only photograph that's of my, an area I know really well, this is my, my uncle lives here, it's a croft on the west coast of Scotland, so this is, this is the Isle of Arran on the west coast, which is really beautiful. So when we have bad climate change, I'll be going there. Um, so before Paris, we were heading this direction. I mean, quite what it looked like. We, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, particularly at the, the higher temperatures, but somewhere like that, RCP 8.5. 4 to 6 degrees C of warming, which is just worth bearing in mind, the difference between now and ice age is something like 5 degrees, obviously, in the other direction, but it's that sort of change that you're seeing in really the blink of an eye. And the Paris pledges add up to something like 3 to 4 degrees centigrade. Remember, the pledges themselves, the official period, is only 2020 to 2030, and they're not necessarily all reduction rates. They can be peak rates, they can be sort of uh, carbon... Um, um, carbon intensity of the economy, they can be all sorts of other ways that, that they're included. So they're, that's what the rule book uh, kind of which is supposed to try to clarify um, but they're a bit mess really but if you try and make some assumptions around them you look at something like this and I would argue we should be from 2019 somewhere around 700 billion tonnes something like that basically zero emissions from energy this is I'm not focusing on the other um, non-CO2 emissions which we need to come down I can talk about those if you want to but um, yeah, the non-CO2 need to come down but we go always have some methane and some um, uh, um, N2O emissions if we, if we carry on with agriculture, eating food. So we can't get those to zero, we can probably get them down a long way. I would probably some, estimate somewhere at four to six billion tonnes equivalent um, for the uh, agricultural emissions of, of feeding nine billion people. But that's a separate issue to hear. So for energy, zero by 2050. We also signed up on the basis of equity, even though we didn't mean it, which means that the wealthy countries have to do something a little bit ahead of the poorer countries and that whole sort of, a, sort of common but differentiated responsibility goes right back to really Kyoto and, and from there. So we repeatedly say that, though it has been weakened in Katowice yet again. Um, so I would argue this is quite a different picture to the euphoria we saw in Paris um, and why is that the case? And also I think quite a lot of the optimism we often see about um, what we're going to do about climate change. And I think it's because the policymakers have received a very different story, and also I think they have wanted to receive a very different story. They don't like this one, nor do most of us who work in the area. And their advice has been dominated by a particular group of modellers, who some of you will be familiar with, maybe some of you engage in this, the integrated assessment modelling community. And they bring together simplified climate models with um, particular types of economic models, normally something along a, um, a general equilibrium, near classical uh, growth model, something along those sorts of lines. Um, and then they sort of make some assessment of how you have, a, have something like a cost-optimised or a cost-effective solution to climate change. They have much larger carbon budgets that sort of emerge from their analysis with obviously much, much less challenging mitigation. So if you took the scenarios submitted to, um, to uh, the IPCC for a, I think this was for a 66% chance of 2 degrees centigrade, um, about 100 or so of them, um, then they are uh, the median value of something like 600 billion tonnes of CO2. This is from 2017 when you work it out. Um, and you have to compare that with, uh, as I'll show now, 800 from the science in 2017, or sort of heading towards 700 now. So this is obviously a couple of years ago. But the, the economic modellers are telling us that we've got nearer 1,600. So there's a very big difference between the two. And I think it's quite hard for a lot of people to really understand, well, how can there be such large differences? Um, and those large differences pretty much, um, this is what, this is I think is probably the second, my second favourite climate change film, um, it's Dr Strangelove. It's a really good ex example of how men love technology and they're going to use it, not all men, but it's generally men and they think it's going to solve all these climate change problems or whatever problems he was dealing with which were not climate change at the time. But I think it captures something about the essence and the approach we have taken to responding to climate change so far. The other film I think is um, Merchants of Doubt, which is a fantastic film, um, uh, Noemi Oreskes and Eric Conway's movie, which is really, the book is excellent, but the film has a lot of different material to the book. Have, you, have any of you seen um, Merchants of Doubt? Yes. 
Not many. If you, have, well, if you get, get hold of it, it was, a, it was made by Sony Classics, so it's got great production values, but then it had virtually no circulation. I wonder why. No idea. Um, but it had virtually no circulation, but you can get it. And if only if you can't get hold of it, I've got a... I think probably it is just about legal now. It wasn't legal when I had it, but I've got a copy which I can let you have. Um, so what we've done is we're pulling rabbits from hats. We've conjured up, and I think that's still the right term to use at the planetary scale, because we don't have these things. They're still quite conceptual, really, at best, I think. And we've conjured up this whole concept of negative emission technologies. Certainly at scale, we've conjured them up. To suck hundreds of billions of tonnes from the um, atmosphere at some point in the future. And they say, we, we haven't conjured them up. Well, we've conjured them up, but you're going to have to invent them and get them to work. And we're passing that on to you again. We'll be, we'll be living in Tuscany, retired by then. Um, well, perhaps not Tuscany, it might be a bit too hot, but anyway, um, <laughs> perhaps Stockholm. But, um, but this, so the emissions go out like this. This is taken again from the uh, sort of median values going out in um, the, the two degrees is now for IPCC. But what's worrying is that they go way after the end of the century. So because we can't be bothered to do anything here, you know, your children, some of your children and probably some of your grandchildren will have to be sucking our CO2 out of the atmosphere in the future. So it is worth just thinking about what we're doing here. We're relying on technologies in the future to solve these issues for us. And we're also relying on not, hopefully not having some additional feedbacks. So Paris, some academics and politicians, rather than focus on urgent and deep mitigation today, rather than question the system, because that has massive political and economic repercussions, we'd rather rely on, at the moment, non-existent technologies to suck hundreds of billions, sometimes up to a trillion tonnes, a trillion tonnes of CO2 um, from the air um, out into the future. If you look at most of the scenarios, they see ongoing use of fossil fuels. There's a great surprise. Um, and basically no major social change required. So business as usual. Davos carries on. Um, so that, I think that's really the framing that we've had that implicitly, sometimes explicitly, informs our thinking around climate change. So if we take away the negative emissions and then start to say, well, what would that look like for the UK? And we've done this now for the UK, we've done it for Sweden, we've done it for quite a few parts of the world, including the EU. We've been feeding into the EU carbon budget debate at the moment. And we've even taken them down to city levels, so we're getting carbon budgets for cities, with the huge uncertainties around them. But I think from a policy perspective, it gives us a really clear picture. So for two degrees centigrade of warming, we have a, we have a global pie. In Manchester we like pies, so that's why you've got pies here. So you've got a global pie, I don't know what you'd have in Oxford, some some fancy tart of some sort. Hmm? <laughs> Lemon drizzle, yeah. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> yeah, I should actually get some different um, images for different parts of the country. So we've got a pie, and if you're Miles Allen, the pie's a bit bigger, and if you're Jason Lowe in the Met Office, the, the pie's a bit smaller. But, but, <laughs> but the pie is broadly, broadly the pie, and we can all argue about quite how big it is, but people take a slightly different view, and you can have these arguments about client sensitivity and what temperature you start from, and a whole host of other things you can, you can embed in there. But basically the Met Office and, and Miles, if you like, take the two ends of that. But we'll just stick with the AR5 for now until we can get some, something better. So we've got about 700 billion tonnes, and then we have the simple task of splitting it amongst the world's nations. And that's obviously, we're all going to be quite clear and honest about that, aren't we? Just ask for our, just the right slice size for us, because that's not what happens. There are some interesting, um, I gather, there's some interesting sort of things in philosophy that help us understand this. If you've got the Chinese negotiate for the um, European Union, the European Union for Nigeria, Nigeria for the US, then actually you, your negotiations from that, I understand, will give you a much fairer allocation. It's only when you get people to negotiate for themselves, they always want a bigger slice. So there are ways we could rethink how to do the negotiations, if we were serious about climate change. So we asked the question, what's a fair slice for the EU? And OK, uh, uh, this is the only picture I can find with a slice of cake, the pie out. So it doesn't mean that's the right size. This is not to scale. Um, and that pie could be quite a lot bigger or quite a lot smaller, because you can divide it out on the basis of historical responsibility, um, population, uh, grandfathered emissions, all sorts of things you can divide it out from. So we've got a range there, but just showing one slice for now. And then we've asked the question, of that, how much would the UK get? And from the UK, we're using, uh, we can go into this later if you want, we use grandfathering. We think grandfathering, once you've gone away from the non oecd countries, we think grandfathering with an equity coefficient is probably the fairest way of allocating out a very tight budget. Grandfathering means you just look at your recent sort of sets of emissions over the last five years or so and take um, your proportion of the total um, over that period and use that to allocate out the budget. So there are some reasons why we think that's much fairer. Population's not very fair. Um, you c we can have arguments about historical responsibility. I think there's some big issues there, but we can talk about that if we need to. But this is within the EU we're doing this now. So grandfathering is what we use. You still get a big range. Includes aviation and shipping. Excludes imports and exports. 
So we're not doing consumption-based, even though I think obviously that's a very important um, set of analysis that needs to be done alongside this, but with much greater uncertainty. And so you end up with a big range, you know, basically three to four gigatons for the UK. And that probably means nothing to many of you, but if you look at what our emissions are in the UK, if you include aviation and shipping, um, it's about seven to nine years of current emissions. So Miles will say that's what you've got for one and a half degrees C. Jason would say, well, that's way over two degrees C. But, you know, so it gives you a flavour of what we would need to be doing. And if you play that out in terms of mitigation rates, if, if anyone wants to have these slides, they can do afterwards. So you know, I'm taking notes if you don't want to. Um, it's something well over 10% per annum reduction rates, well over. I mean, I really sh should put the numbers a bit higher than this. If you play it out, it comes out nearer 15 to 20%. But we sort of always err on the side of, I've been too, too optimistic perhaps, even when we're doing this analysis. So something like that. That's a, a sort of total reduction of something like 75% reduction by about uh, 2025, which is really just tomorrow when you think about it. Um, and fully decarbonised energy system, energy note here, for, um, for the UK, but mostly, or pretty much all OECD countries will be somewhere between 2035 and 2040 to be zero carbon energy, not low, zero carbon energy. Um, <clears throat> and the non-OECD countries are about 15 years later than that. And within those bounds, that some would be later than others, so Germany would be a bit earlier than, than Greece, and Greece would be a bit later, and that sort of thing. And the same within non-OECD. Some countries would have a lot longer, and other countries, like China, would have to be a lot sooner in the emissions. And we can talk about that later if someone wants to ask me about the numbers behind it all. But that gives you a flavour of what we'd have to try and do. And whichever way you could play with the budgets, it doesn't really move away from the fact we're talking about an order of magnitude rate of mitigation different to anywhere else, anyone else's analysis, pretty much. So it's a complete different agenda to the normal one that we get to here. So a question, a reasonable question to ask then is, are these rates viable? Um, and I was almost bordering on no, until quite recently, about, well, about a year, year and a half ago probably. Uh, my colleague, um, Alice Larkin, previously Bose, she thinks it is impossible. Glenn Peters, one of my uh, sort of colleagues and someone I work with from time to time in, in Norway, thinks it's impossible. I am aware that one or two people here who remain nameless think it's impossible as well. And I'm bordering on that, but I'm not quite sure yet. I don't think it's, I don't think it's likely, I don't think it's very likely. I, um, I, think it's, I think it's very unlikely, rather. But I think I could envisage how you could deliver on it. And I'm going to try and touch on that in a minute. And it comes back to this issue of equity. The IPCC plus Paris equals equity. That's my sort of question. That goes back to my first opening thought experiment about the big reductions that we could have from a small percentage of the population. CO2, and some of you have seen these slides anyway, um, uh, these figures, but CO2 is highly skewed to a small group of the population at a global level. So this is global income deciles. Um, so this is, have you all seen this before? No? Okay. Oh, it's, a, it's a really useful slide. Never makes it into the IPCC reports, but anyway. Um, that's probably because it is useful. The, uh, what you have here are um, income deciles, poorest, the richest, and these are the emissions. And what you see is the poorest, the poorest 50% are responsible for about 10% um, of global emissions. This is taken from the work by uh, Lucas Chancellor and Thomas Piketty in 2015. And the, the infographic was done by Oxfam later on, but it's, it's based on their data. Um, and it's a really interesting methodology. I would definitely recommend reading the report. It's a really interesting method that they've used to try to take globe, total global emissions and then attribute them to the activities of individuals within the, within the world. So it doesn't take a national approach at all. About, so if you go to the top 10% here, so most emissions relate to the top group here, as you can imagine. 50% um, of global emissions come from 10% of the global population. 50% from 10% of the population. And we know who they are. Yeah, academics, climate change audiences, policy makers, business people. We know that, we know that 10% are. And we see them when we shave or put our makeup on. Um, that 70% of global emissions come from 20% of the population. So why is it we, when we have policies, the policies are generally aimed at the whole population and basically squeezing the emissions out of those people that hardly emit? Now this is a completely different agenda now. It says you've got to tailor your policies to those that emit. What a radical idea. Um, but we don't do that at the moment. We, we try and squeeze them out of the, the people that barely emit. And, and people like me love the idea of a carbon price because professors can just afford it. I can just pay the extra on a price of a flight or a fancy car. A carbon price means nothing to me. But if you live in the uh, um, fuel poverty homes around Manchester, you can't even afford energy today, let alone a carbon price on top of the energy. So massive equity implications for some of these things. And I would argue when you start to see it like this, that you end up, end up I would suggest, from a, a, 
I'm not saying what the policies would look like, but you, there's a, if we're serious about anything like a two degree C framing, then there's a three phase strategy you have to have. And I can't see a way out of this. Um, and it's partly because of the time frame issues, coming back to the, um, the curves earlier. In the immediate term, you have to have profound changes in the behaviors and the energy related behaviors and practices of high energy users. That includes consumption, because above a certain threshold, our emissions come out of our consumption rather than out of our energy use. So once you get really above professor levels, then you start to see people's consumption habits are where the energy and the emissions are, are locked in. That's what's interesting in the methodology that um, Chancellor and Piketty use. So I'm not saying it's going to happen voluntarily. You'd have to have regulations to drive this in some way, but it would be helpful if some people who are in that category started to demonstrate they could do it. In the near to medium term, we need really tight efficiency standards. Because on the demand side, you can make rapid changes um, in, in emissions. But you can only do that if you've got policies to stop the rebound effects. Now, energy efficiency has never brought a reduction in anything. It, just cre it almost always feeds into economic growth. So inefficiency, if efficiency benefits overall just help you grow your economy, help you increase your emissions. But that doesn't mean to say that it has to do that. You could put policies in there. Um, to help overcome that, you know, progressive metering tariffs. There's a whole suite of things you could do, but we've never done that historically. But if you look at something like an A-rated refrigerator, and then look at an A++ refrigerator for the same size, there's between a 60 and 80% difference in energy consumption. 60 to 80%. So why are we selling rubbish A-rated refrigerators? Because we have a liberalised choice system, so we can buy crap if we really want to. Um, but if you just said, well, the standard's got to be an A++ this year, and next year it has to be 10% better, and the year after that 10% better, you could very rapidly change energy on the demand side. Same with cars. You know, the, why is it we're selling cars at 200 and 250 grams, when you can buy an IC engine, a turn combustion engine car, at 85 to 100 grams, even with the VW scams? So you can, you can still get cars at much lower that will take three children's seats in the back and you know, still do 70 or 80 miles an hour on the motorway. So why are we selling ones with high grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. If you put standards in to drive these things, you would rapidly shift things through. About 60 to 80 percent of all the vehicle kilometres travelled in the UK, and for most of the EU countries this is true, are travelled by cars that are under eight years old. So it takes very little time to percolate through the system if you change demand with the policies around it to stop the rebound effect. And the rebound effect is important because we found in the EU we've had no reduction in transport fuel emissions over the last few years and we've had an increase in the US over the last year. So efficiency, really important. And of course, we have to do the thing that we always talk about, energy supply. Energy supply is massively important, but it cannot deliver in the time frame we want. And therefore, you have to do these things here. So this is your immediate term, this is your medium term, and this is your medium to long term. And it's not really that long. I mean, you've only got till 2035, 2040. So it's, I sort of call it like a Marshall-style construction of Europe. And, I mean, obviously, the Marshall Plan came with all quite nasty other issues in it politically, but the actual sort of infrastructure change is what I'm talking about, that scale of change. And even that wouldn't be as big as what we'd have to make in terms of what I'm talking about here. So this is like energy supply and massive electrification. Remember, only 20% of the energy we can, the final energy we consume, not the primary, it's always worth separating those two, of the final energy we consume, only 20% is electricity. 80% of it is not electricity. So you've got to have a massive level of electrification. Probably a three-fold, if not four-fold, increase in electrification. Which is, if you were discussing nuclear the other day, that's, it makes some interesting implications for whether nuclear or indeed the renewables are viable at those sorts of levels. And I think the bit I'm saying that I think is really important, the bit, of course, that goes back to the right beginning, the asymmetry, uh, the asymmetry of our um, resources, is that what we're saying, regardless whether you're, you know, whether you're a socialist or a, a rabid laissez-faire type, the basic maths tell you here that in the short term, whilst you respond to climate change, you've got to take the labor and, re labor and resources that are used in furnishing the lives of these people here. You're not handing it to the poor. You're taking, you're taking those resources and you're saying you're using that to change the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure of the world in which we live. And you can't do both. You can't carry on having this and do this at the same time. So it's just like Roosevelt going in you know, and telling the companies they've got to change what they were doing. It's just like us introduced rationing in the, in the Second World War. You have to start to, to say we've got a limited amount of resources, a limited amount of labour, and they've got to be doing the things like this if we're going to respond to climate change. And this is even if you have big improvements in efficiency and reductions in energy demand. The UK is about 1,800 terawatt hours. So I would think you could probably get it down to something like 1,000 to 1,200 terawatt hours. Just remember it's 1,800. So when people start talking about electricity at 300 to 330, just remember what the real figures are. So this is a shift in productive capacity, I would argue, at least similar to what we saw in World War II. There are very, very few parallels out there. I think probably things, if we're really talking about what we're, the sort of shift we're talking about, you can't use acid rain or ozone or any of these things. Probably you have to go right back to things like the abolition of slavery 
You know, slavery was the principal um, structure by which we ran our economies in, in the US and much of Europe. And when it was abolished, that took a long time. Um, and, and very sadly, what we had to do was actually we, we ended up compensating the slave owners, which I, f I find quite reprehensible. We may have to think about how do we do that now? How do you compensate the Saudi Arabias, the, the Qatars, the BPs, the Shells? Do we have to do that? Is that going to be part of our, our solution? I'm really uncomfortable about that. But maybe lessons in history tell us we can't just make that change without thinking about those things. I hope we can find a way around that. But it, it, we are talking about changes that are, are only have occurred in, in sort of post-enlightenment on a handful of occasions. Maybe you know, the emancipation uh, of women and, the, and, and universal suffrage is another one. But there are very few of these examples. And the sorts of shifts I'm talking about are you know, all the things that as academics, and know if you come to Oxford, you're desperate trying to do this anyway. So you come here to get a good education, so you can get a good job, to get more money, so you can buy more stuff and have a higher carbon footprint. That's, that's the main reason you come to Oxford. I know that's not, <laughs> not completely true. <laughs> but I'm saying that, that is, I bet I, can, I bet I can guarantee, come back and look at most of your lives in 10 years from now, you'll, or, it, maybe it will have changed, but most of the time, 10 years from now, you'll have a higher carbon footprint than you have now. 10 years after that, it'll be higher again. So remember, your whole future is aspiring to have a higher carbon footprint because it brings the things with us that tell us how important we are. Large houses, holiday homes, second homes, prestige cars, SUVs, multiple car ownerships, highly mobile lives. Academics love that. We fly around the world at taxpayers' expense. Frequent flyers, business class, first travel, high levels of consumer goods. You know, all the things that we aspire to, all the things that our world tells us, you know, this is about prestige. This tells us we're doing something right. But the resources going to provide these, which are not just, despite what some think tanks might try and tell us, are just the cream. They're not. This is a huge proportion of our resources, which is why you see this when you look at the emissions curves. The reason the emissions are in this particular group is because that's where the resources are. So let's not pretend the resources are sort of spread out amongst the poor. They're not. They're highly concentrated in a particular small group of society. That includes me. And we need that, those resources, that labour and materials to help us make this transformation from an 81% fossil fuel industry. Uh, energy system to a zero fossil fuel, uh, a zero fossil fuel energy infrastructure in 20 years. This is a zero carbon industrial strategy. This is, this is hugely challenging, way beyond I think anything that anyone is yet contemplating really. So are there any, anyway, I can see why people say this is just not possible, we're not going to deliver this. Um, and I think we're on the cusp of failing on this and heading for somewhere pretty appalling. But I think there are some early signs of possible deep system change. Now I wrote this, um, I thought about this when I was coming back from Bonn, which was an appalling event. Katowice was much better than Bonn. Bonn was just terrible. Um, no, the, the COP a couple of years ago. But whether you're a politician, a scientist, academic, business people, journalists or civil society, we're all going to hell in a handcart at the moment. We're all, we're all going somewhere which we don't want to be. There's, nothing po there's, there's virtually no positive stories out there at any large-scale collective level. That's not to say that we're awash with lots of positive stories at smaller scales. But we're not seeing any, anything at a large scale, which is why the emissions keep going up. So we're off to... If anyone knows where... I couldn't get the... I still can't find out where this painting comes from. So if any of you Oxford people might know. One of you might even have it at home. Um, <laughs> if anyone knows, let me, let me know. Um, so so I, can't, I can't give them justice. Anyway, so it is their light in despair. And uh, when I was coming back from Bonn, I was on the train back up from Bonn, back up to Sweden, which is where I work part of the time, and... Uh, I was quite depressed, so I was trying to write something cathartic to try and lift my, lift my mood on the train. Um, and I had a couple of days to do it. So I wrote something which then got picked up by the conversation and was published um, by them. It's also on my website. Um, and it was just hope from chaos. Could political upheaval lead to a new green epoch? And it, was, it is you know, desperately looking at straws to grab. But are there any straws to grab and are they reasonable to think about? And I, I was thinking about post-2008 at the time. You know, well, you know, it's 10 years. So... Um, what are the things we might have seen? The banking crisis. The bank, and the, I'm not saying these are good things. Some of these clearly are not good things. Though you might argue one way or another about that. The banking crisis. Quantitative easing. Go back to 2006, even halfway through 2007, and say to chancellors, just say to all the economic pontificators that we'd like the government to write a cheque for half a trillion pounds. They'd think you were mad. They were doing it a year later. So we had quantitative, we weren't short of money, no shortage of money. Okay, well not all of it was real, some of it was fabricated, but most of this money was spent on resources one way or another. So overnight, the UK managed to find, well it found about a quarter of a trillion overnight, and it took a little bit longer to find the other half a trillion. So it found huge quantities of money. And it could have used that, like um, Korea and China did in part, to help drive a sort of greening infrastructure. It didn't, they just squandered it in its usual sort of 
um, reckless fashion. But we had a huge amount of money. It could have helped us retrofit the houses, done a lot with our energy system. Um, and that's not, not just here, but many parts of the world. We've got social media. Now, I'm actually all in favour of social media. Give me the choice between four rich white men that own the papers in the UK or 60 million nutters sending me tweets. I'll take the 60 million nutters every time. Because at last we managed to escape the idea that our media and the stories we hear about have been controlled for 100 years by particular ways of looking at the world. Particular types of people that come from particular types of institutions that have run things. Now, that's not saying they're bad people. It's not saying the news hasn't always been something that's been really interesting. But it comes with a particular take, a particular set of baggage, inevitably. I would prefer, I prefer this social media there, even though it comes with a lot of really major problems. But I think there are some real merits to opening up the space so that all sorts of people can have their voices heard. So I'm not opposed to social media, though I think there are, we have to find somewhere trying to control some of its worst excesses. Sanders and Corbyn, not saying there's a good or bad. I, mean, I have my views, you can take your own pick on them. You know, these are people who have really radical positions. Sanders stood up and said he's a socialist and wasn't shot in America. That's quite an achievement. Um, you know, Corbyn, everyone, the, the, the PLP, the Labour Party didn't like Corbyn. The, the BBC didn't like him. The Guardian didn't like him. They're, let alone the right. I mean, the, the Conservatives loathed him and so did uh, um, that was the Telegraph. But no one supported Corbyn. But it's interesting how through social media he had quite a, had a, has had been moderately successful and had quite an influence. The same thing with Sanders in the US. Brexit, Trump, whoever thought these things wouldn't happen? You go back to a year before each of these occurred, no one thought this is going to happen. This is just ridiculous. Of course we're not going to do that. We don't want to come out of the EU. Which idiot would ever put the vote forward anyway? And who, which idiot would vote for it? I'm not saying we're idiots by doing it, but that's what our sort of view would have been. Yet yeah, we had that. Who would vote for Trump? Who would vote for the Swedish Democrats, an ex-Nazi party in Sweden? 18% of people in Sweden voted for them. So there's a whole new anti-establishment constituency here. And actually, I'm really pleased they're voting. I don't ple I'm not pleased they're voting for these people. And I was talking with Oliver earlier about this. I think, you know, it's, it, they're, they're voting for these people because pe progressive lefties like me have not provided a good narrative for what a positive future looks like for these people in the Dust Belt or in the Rhondda Valley or the northeast of the, of the UK who have had their industries decimated. So there's a whole scope of here, a new constituency who want to have their voices heard and want to see a new world. The Arab Spring, OK, ended up being a... A bloodbath, but I mean, there were, there were benefits out of their arrow of spring, new voices coming to the fore, continuing plum plummeting price of renewables. They're not, they're not yet showing any sign of bottom, um, bottoming out. The latest offshore round for renewable off for offshore wind turbines is, is half the price of the last, last round. Now, they've not delivered them yet, but if they do deliver them at that price, that's an, that's an incredible shift in the prices, which does, you know, is already creating some instability in the market. And solar panels just keep coming down in price all the time, or solar power does. And also then there's concerns about fossil fuel um, impacts on health, which were not there before, and even the IMF are engaged in this. So the whole suite of these things there, and what I'm arguing is that in themselves, these disruptions are important, but they're, much, they're still sort of in isolation, they're evolutionary, they're not revolutionary. So, I mean, at the time they feel revolutionary, like the banking crisis, but what do we do? We found new ways to lightly regulate the banks and just wait for the next crisis. So the same people in charge, nothing really significant occurred. But at the time it felt revolutionary, but it's turned out to be an evolutionary shift. But if you could align some of these things, if you could actually start to say, how do we bring some of these things together? Are there ways that we can manipulate the system? The we here is not going to be the establishment most of the time. Some of them perhaps, but are there ways that we can manipulate the system? And actually then maybe we could start to see something, when you bring these together, whatever they might be, something much more revolutionary. I don't think the world is this static place that if you live in Oxford or Manchester, we go to university every day, it feels the same every day. There are big changes occurring all around us in all sorts of ways, but they're not, they're not aligned in any way, and some of them are obviously very bad as well. So could it be much more revolutionary? Most political and economic pontificators, this is just taken from the piece, um, buttressed by naysayers and established elites, remain incapable of seeing beyond their familiar 20th century horizon. And in universities, I would argue, most of the time it's the 19th century, probably in Latin. Um, but the 21st century is already proving how the future is a different country, one that could yet be shaped by alternative interpretations of prosperity, sustainability and equity. So I think we are starting to see different stories, different narratives coming out. Um, and again, it's our role to some extent to try and foster those if we, if we are supportive of them. So do we have something to offer this new agenda? Um, are we prepared to think post-growth? I'm not saying degrowth. I, I, I prefer the idea of just moving away from the concept of growth at all. Degrowth or, or post-growth. Just let's look at things in their own units, if you like. Don't have to see them as growing or shrinking. You know, I'd like to see more improved female literacy around the world. That's growth, but it doesn't really necessarily play out in economic growth. Be open-minded to technical opportunities, but also to their limitations. 
consider short-term rationing of energy because that's I don't think there's a way around that I think we have to we have to be open about that we have to deliver some sort of rationing we can go we can go away from the rationing later on once we solve the problem if it fits with other sustainability criteria which it may or may not but from a climate perspective we have to ration it I think we have to stand up to the bullying of the city and of the Davos set and I would also say a really deep deep-seated tyranny that occurs within our universities and I, I, I spoke in, in the piece I wrote um, coming back from Katowice this year I spoke about that having spoke to a lot of early career re researchers who just said they then ask questions they then ask questions at COP they then ask questions of their supervisors you know what are we doing in universities if we're stopping younger voices who have not got the baggage that we've got yet speaking out we should be you know, really encourage them to speak out openly. And I repeatedly hear that from early career researchers and people on short-term contracts that they can't speak out openly against their established peer review, um, established um, uh, um, peers. So, do we have the cogency to nasty encourage to escape? And I, I, was, I tried all sorts of other words for this, but none of them really captured it. I, I, I don't think there's a neat way around it. I think we are, it's a, this sort of neoliberal black hole that we have. And it depends how you look at that sort of a laissez-faire view of the world, the sort of the current socioeconomic paradigm that's particularly dominant in the US and the UK, slightly less so in some of the European countries. You know, can we escape this way of looking at the world, this Davos sort of mindset? Um, I think we probably can. So to conclude, in 2019, climate change is system change. It wasn't in 1990 we chose to fail. It wasn't in 2000 we carried on failing. By 19, 2019, the, whether you take Miles' budget or whether you take um, the Met Office budget, there's basically nothing left significant. So you know, we are talking about taking the budget and then asking questions of our norms and our paradigms. We, uh, we, are, we have got to do the obvious, transform energy supply technologies. We have to do that. We need a rapid penetration of energy efficiency technologies. These things are really there. We can start to make those transitions today. And there are big issues around storage and uh, intermittency to some extent and frequency control and all those things, but they're, they are all resolvable in a reasonable time frame. This is probably very difficult. We need profound shifts in our behaviours and our practices. And I don't just mean tweaks. I mean, do we mean profound shifts in them? We need to reframe value, success and progress. Why do we only see, you see success in, in, in celebrity, in stars and successful business people. Not if you're, if you're a nurse looking after children with cystic fibrosis. That's not success. Why is that not success? Why are they paid you know, £30,000 a year and yet we pay some you know, hedge fund manager or developer or whatever it might be, some huge son or even a professor. You know, why do I get paid more than a virgin train driver? Um, you know, the, we've got to start to rethink what is important in our society and how we should be measuring those things. So I think this, this is very difficult, and I would argue that's the case for sustainability, but in the short term it's definitely the case for climate change. We need, an e we need an economic model that's fit for purpose. I don't know what your various backgrounds are, but I come from an engineering background. And if I was doing work on, um, uh, on aer using aerodynamics over a car, or even over my bike, if I'm going really fast, I'm going to use turbulent flow. If I'm going really slowly, I'm going to use laminar flow. I would never muddle the two up because it would be meaningless. And yet in economics, the economic model we use is a basically a general equilibrium, marginal economic model. You know, it's about small changes near equilibrium. We're nowhere near equilibrium and we're talking about step changes. So no other field of, in, of academic endeavour would ever use a model that was completely and utterly inappropriate to drive the framing of our, of our agenda. And that's repeatedly what we do here. It's like using Newton to understand quantum mechanics. And why on earth are we doing that? There are plenty of good economic models out there with a much better framing, like ecological economics in its various forms, to address this issue. The current model is just not fit for purpose, and yet it dominates the debate. All of this has got to start now and be completed in about three decades. So it's, from an academic point of view, it's quite interesting, because I think the paper's blank to some extent. Uh, quite, you know, we may know what the strategy is, but we don't really know what the policies look like, and they will be different between different countries. We've got a long way to go. Do we really care about these people? when we think it's perfectly reasonable to have an increase in, in private yacht sales during the period of austerity. Yeah. During austerity, private yacht sales went up. Do we really care about our own future, own, own children's future, when we've got the, the, you know, the Gates and the Virgins and the, what's his name, Musk, space, you know, developing space travel, which I'm, I always sort of jokingly say I'm not completely against as long as the tickets are one way. <laughs> so, um, because you know, there are always people with, people with high carbon footprints who will always be on board. So I'm quite happy to see them go to Pluto. Um, do we care about future generations when we think it's perfectly reasonable to ride, drive around in three tons? Yeah, we think about what could be in there. It could be me, I'm, I'm 83 kilograms, 83 kilograms of flesh in 3,000 kilograms of car, driving, what, six kilometres to pick up 10 kilograms of groceries. Is that a reasonable thing to do in 2019? And if it's a Tesla, it's still no better. You know, slightly, slightly less worse, perhaps. You know, We've got migrants, what the first thing we do when we see migrants, we put up, you know, we put up razor wire. And yeah, I regularly cycle past houses like this in Cheshire with lots of bedrooms that could fit in migrants. So you know, are we really concerned about those sorts of things we're starting to see around us? Do we really worry about other 
species and other ecosystems where we merrily are just building, a, the EU is building a massive gas network now. And the Swedes, who hardly use any gas, are building a new gas terminal in Gothenburg to bring over shale gas from the rest of the world. So we're locking in a high carbon infrastructure right at this moment. The EU is spending your, our money, our tax money, probably not Britain soon, but anyway, our, our tax money on building two massive gas pipelines. To really, really worry about the beauty of living this fantastic planet, the little blue dot uh, in this inky darkness, when we merrily fly to another essential climate change conference or holiday in Bali. Um, I, don't, I do have quite a few discussions with Alex Stefan on Twitter, but I really like this quote he used here. Or I think it's just one he made up. Winning slowly is basically the same thing as losing outright. In the face of both triumphant denialism and predatory delay, triumphant denialism is just what Trump does and, and, and some others, and I don't really care about them too much, and the predatory delay, that's what the climate progressives do. That's what we do as an academic community. We're always trying to find some way to delay action. And I think that's much more dangerous. Trying to achieve climate action by doing the same thing, the same old ways, means defeat. It guarantees defeat. And at the moment, just look at everything around us in terms of the aggregate impacts. Not the, not the good things that go on here and there, but the aggregate impacts. Everything is pointing in the wrong direction. Emissions up again 2.7% in 2018. So we are guaranteeing defeat unless we start to think radically differently. But I'm trying to suggest, I think, and I know other people don't agree with, us, with me on this, I think we can still just have an outside chance of two degrees centigrade if we're prepared to address the political, social and economic implications as well as the technical ones. So thanks for listening.